We turn then to the account of Moses in Hebrews. These men and women that knew God and lived by faith. I've titled this section Fearless Faith because faith in God has consistently enabled very ordinary people to do very extraordinary things. When you know that God is for you, as Paul writes in Romans, you know that it doesn't matter who is against you. Because he who gave his only begotten Son will also freely give us all that we need. A slight paraphrase of Romans 8 and verse 36 and 7, I think. Fearless faith. I found this little picture to help us understand what it means. It's written by a man called Walter Baxendale. And he writes like this, Upon the plains of Waterloo there stands a great bronze lion forged from the captured guns of Britain's foes in 1815. The beast's mouth is open and snarls through his teeth over the battlefield. When I saw it last one spring noonday, a bird had built its nest right in the lion's mouth, twining the twigs of the downy bed where the fledglings nestled around the very teeth of the metal monster. And from the very jaws of the bronze beast, the chirp of the swallows seemed to twitter forth timidly the toxin of peace. It was the audacity of hope. The audacity of hope. When you know what God has said, when you can rehearse how what he has said has been fulfilled, then by God's grace you are equipped to face all the lions and monsters of life, personal, social, and wherever else they might raise their ugly heads as Bunyan tells us in Pilgrim's Progress as Christian goes towards House Beautiful. The fearful pair have run in the opposite direction telling him there are lions. And as Bunyan approaches from the House Beautiful comes the message, don't fear, the lions are chained. That's our confidence because of what Christ did. And that's the confidence the writer of Hebrews is trying to instill in his audience then and now because fear is a great monster that weakens even the fittest and strongest amongst us and I want you to look at what happened in Moses life to learn like I have how that while at times our knees might knock when underneath are the everlasting arms we can do all things through him who strengthens us. I have three subheadings. First of all, fearless faith faces God's enemies. Secondly, it follows God's word. And then thirdly, sticking to the use of the letter F, fronting God's people, leading God's people. It equips us to face God's enemies. It's interesting here in verse 23 that when it begins talking about Moses' faith, it actually goes back to show us that that faith was alive in his parents. That that faith was showing in their lives. Hebrews, Jews, who had been in captivity at this time from what we know of the rest of the story, around 400 years. Somewhere in their past, they would have heard of God's promise to Abraham that after 400 years, they would be released from captivity. And as I studied this verse, I couldn't help asking myself, why did they do it? What was behind them? I think they are a profoundly important example of what it means to live by faith, even when the world around you seems to be completely at odds with you. When the way through seems to be a closed door, they have hope. 
Faith is the substance of things hoped for. Back to verse 1. They had hope. God had spoken. They expected God to act. And that, dear friends, is a, a very important definition of faith. Believing God over everything that is going on around you and in your world. Not because you are in some way mentally deranged, but rather because you know that God's word is better than money in the bank. He said it, it will happen. He said it, I can bank on it. And that's what you see in Moses' parents. They stand by faith. One of the interesting things I read was that Moses was the seventh generation from Abraham. In the book I had traced back all the ancestors. And of course the importance of the number seven among the Jewish people would be active in their minds. That God had come to that point where it was necessary to fulfill what he had concluded, what he had revealed. Now, before we even tease out the verse, can I, can I impress upon you as I seek to do to myself that this is how to live, that this is real life. The enemy will come in as he did to Eve and whisper, has God really said? He's never changed his tactics. And that's the power of the world around us. Is it really true? May God give you the grace to come back and say, yes, amen. God has spoken. I believe it. I will live it. I put it to you because you're making choices day after day about whether you're going to go God's way or your own, which is actually where Satan wants you to go. You're making choices, not just in the big issues of life, but in every issue of life. And we're called to walk in the Spirit, to allow the Word of God to be the directing agent in our lives. And that's exactly what we're going to see here. Moses' parents' choices were determined by what they understood about God and what God has said. They're living by his word. They're acting by his word. Do you remember how the book of Joshua finishes chapter 24 and 15? And if it seems evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your father served that were on the other side of the river, that's in Egypt, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It challenged me when I read this passage to find that as I was going to find out about Moses' faith, I'm first focused on his parents' faith. I'm first focused on the fact that his parents risked their lives. Exodus 1, 22, So Pharaoh commanded all his people, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, every daughter you shall save alive. It was a royal legal decree. He was the king of the country, the law of the land. Boy, children, kill them. And I must say, I've been weeping this week in my heart as I listen to all these political manifestos. What we are now getting from our politicians is horrendous. And if we are not judged as the Amorites were judged in Canaan, I can't believe that God will hold his hand back. But I'll not go entirely down that road. Look here. Pharaoh had designed the 
termination of life at death. That's what they're boldly talking about now, isn't it? The baby can come out of the womb, but we've turned doctors into murderers. Oh, let me move on. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. The mysteries in this verse just deepen. It's a mystery as to why Moses' parents acted as they did, why they were prepared to contradict the law of the land. But you can actually tease it out. You can trace it back to the promise to Abraham. You can trace it forward to the hope of the fulfillment after 400 years. The other mystery here is the meaning of that word beautiful. What did his parents see in Moses? The NIV tries to help us when it says he was no ordinary child. But even there we're left struggling a bit to understand. There was clearly something about this baby when he was born that made him distinct and made his parents think of the promises given back through history. Remember, the reason the Jews are so attentive to genealogy is because of the promises of God to Abraham and to Eve. The one was coming who would be their saviour and deliverer. And I like to think, and please notice it's me thinking, not the word saying. I like to think that somewhere in their thinking was this idea, is this the one? They were wrong in one sense, he's not the Christ, but he does prefigure Christ. He'll say in Deuteronomy that there will be a prophet like him in the future. And therefore I'm not critical of his parents. I'm rather amazed at God's wondrous grace. When Stephen gets himself in trouble in Acts chapter 7 verse 20, you get another reference to this. It says, at this time Moses was born and was well pleasing to God. Lovely picture, isn't it? Wish I'd been there with my camera and recorded it. That would have solved a lot of problems, but it does draw you back into this great truth that God is working in history and that his promises revolved around the seed who was coming. And that all God's people were expected to do, even then, was to believe God and live it out. That's faith. We come through faith to a personal relationship with God and then we live by faith. From faith to faith is how Paul describes it in Romans chapter 1, doesn't he? Taking it from the book of Hosea, isn't it? From faith to... It's a process day after day after day. You and I are... In courage to believe God and not to believe the world. And what a process took place back then. You remember the story? I, it, it, one of the great temptations with all these characters is just to go back and reread it. We would spend all morning just reading scripture. I, I'm depending on you having read the account. When he was three months old, they put him in a basket. And they put him in the River Nile. But not just anywhere. At the very spot where Pharaoh's sister was bathing. And ladies, it seems to affect you more than it does us gents, but it gets us too. There's something magical about a baby's whimper and cry, isn't there? You just have to see the smile, and suddenly you connect. I would suggest to you that poor woman didn't have any chance at all. His name, Moses, means drawn out of the water. And so she took him to her home. The story becomes even more remarkable. She recognizes as a Hebrew child. How would that happen? 
Can I suggest that Moses would already have been circumcised? I checked some details yesterday. The, the, the Egyptians did carry out a form of circumcision, but not until a young man was becoming an adult. And so to find a baby that was circumcised just says one thing, Hebrew. Somebody who believes God's promises. She could have reacted, she didn't. She finds a Hebrew woman to look after the baby. Exodus 2.9 Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give him, I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. Who was the woman? Moses' mother. What an incredible provision of God. From the outside, at every stage you might have thought, this is madness. No, this is faith. At every stage you might have thought, oh dear, it's not going to work. But that's the challenge of trusting God's word and not what you can measure by your eyes or your senses. That's the, the, the power of it. God is working all things together for good. Of course you believe it. It's in the Bible. Do you believe it? I would suggest to you, the evidence that you believe it is not whether you can quote it, but whether you're praying every day for the grace to live in. God works everything. Lord, how can that be? You look at our own circumstances and the heart breaks at the indifference society has to Christianity. No, even the antagonism. Yet Moses' parents set the pattern. It goes on in the next verse, by faith, Moses, when he became of age, that's when he becomes a man, some years later, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. So something, you have to use your mind a little bit, don't you? Not only would Pharaoh's daughter have seen he was circumcised, he would have well. And somewhere in that must have been the question, what's this all about? Why has this happened to me and not to the, my, my best friends? And somewhere in there, he has to have learned of the significance of the promise that the, the, the circumcision was a sign of the covenant with Abraham and it was an indicator that there was a promise of a deliverer coming. And it seems to have spoken to him. By faith, when Moses became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Let it sink in. He had every privilege that a, 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 an Egyptian pharaoh had. In a land of slavery, he had servants waiting on him. He never went hungry. He had the best of clothes, the best of entertainments. He had the best of everything. And he said that, no thank you. Notice how the scripture teases it out refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. That's not my heritage. That's the challenge to you and I in modern times, isn't it? Again, when Christianity is on its back foot as it appears, there's so much pressure on us to fit in. When faith's working, there are times when you need to stand out. You've not to become obnoxious with it so that you're in everybody's face all the time, but when there are choices to be made, you're ready to say, no, I'm going God's way. I've read God's word. I've heard God speak. I know what God thinks. He loves me. And I'm going to believe that whatever's going wrong, he's going to make right. So Pharaoh says, sorry, Moses says, no thank you. He refuses the status. In Acts 
725. There's an indication from what Stephen says that Moses was aware that a deliverer was coming and was thinking he was the deliverer. That's why he kills the Egyptian and then has to run for his life. He's a man of faith. He's not perfect. By faith, when he became of age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And then 25 and 26 are vitally important to our thinking. Why would you do that? Murder a man because of Darwin's message and thinking and how it's been developed thinks this is all there is. Grab what you can. Trample on whoever is necessary. Make yourself number one. Because nobody else will. It's quite contrary to the thinking of a man or woman of faith. I'm going to trust God. I'm going to go where God wants me to go, be who God wants me to be, no matter what anybody else thinks. So here it says, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. Isn't that a profoundly insightful statement? It acknowledges, you see, that sin has pleasure. There's a thrill in it. There's an excitement in it. And when society says that what God says is sin is no longer sin, immorality, foul language, do I need to draw a list for you? You'll be bumping into them all the time. He says no thank you to that. But why would you Say no thank you to that. Notice what the text says. Esteeming the reproach of Christ. Oh, I wish I could talk to Moses. Wait a minute. I will do one day. What did he know about Christ? Jesus is disputing with the Pharisees in John 5, 46. He says to them, If you believe Moses, you would believe me. For he wrote about me. What did Moses understand about Christ? Enough to understand that there are two paths through life. The broad way leading to destruction and the narrow way through to which you enter through Christ. Where does the broad way go? Destruction. Where does the narrow way go? Life. And that's the, the crisis for all humanity. That's, what, that, that, that's where you were transformed and made a believer. I am the door by me if any man enters in. He shall be saved. And I like how it finishes. And come in and go out and find pasture. Get on with life. Esteeming the reproach of Christ's greater riches than the treasures in Egypt. You ever watch any of these archaeology programs about what they found in the, the pyramids? It's fascinating, isn't it? Gold everywhere. Where would you be if somebody says you can have it all? Moses says, keep it. He has treasure in heaven. There is a promise of God that because God has reserved it for him, First Peter, that God will keep him till he gets it, even though he has to go through times of trial. Again, a paraphrase of First Peter chapter 1. And so he can say, no, thank you. Why? Because he looked for the reward. He looked for the day when he would receive all that God had promised. He looked for the day when he would rise up. That's faith at work. Remember, faith is a substance of things not seen. It's what gives reality to what God has promised, even though you can't see it. 
the evidence faith is a substance of things hoped for the evidence of things not seen you should have corrected me and here it is powerful powerful in our face powerful as it challenges me in a day and an age when we are really spoiled and pampered has your house got central heating? Everybody's has now. But, well, somebody's hasn't. I remember as a boy, when I started work, I was up first in the morning. It was my job to light the fire. Everybody else got the benefit, but I was frozen while doing it. We take it for granted now. The boiler goes off and we're up pulling our hair out. No, I, I, I'm not getting rid of central heating anytime soon. That is only just a pathetic illustration of how rich and luxurious our lives have become. <sighs> Moses says no thank you to all that stuff because he's looking for what God promises. I need to be helped to look for what God has promised. And I need to be able to communicate to the people who are not with me in Christ that, dear friends, I need to tell you a tragic truth. Everything you've worked for and accumulated will be left behind. I've just had a mischievous idea. If you die without Christ, you're going to have permanent central eating. There'll be no laughing matter. You know what it's like when it gets too hot in the house? My little lady has a, an internal nuclear generator where the temperature changes quite suddenly. Have you turned the heating up? No, dear, I haven't moved. You see, heat can be uncomfortable. Jesus tells us most about hell and he hangs a big sign over it. Don't go there. Please, dear friends, come to faith in Christ. Trust him. I know you'll have things to work out. Trust him. Because when you look at the evidence here, he's well worth trusting. Faith is following God's word. Just check the time. Oh dear. That's just the first point. I need to get the second one. The third one is very short. Following God's word. Verse 27 through to verse 29 or the first part of it. By faith he forsook Egypt, Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. Now, quite clearly, when he was 40 and he murdered the Egyptian and even his own people turned their back on him, he hot-legged it out of town for 40 years. He was afraid. So that's not what this is talking about. This is talking about the Moses who after 40 years as a shepherd in the backside of the wilderness had a living encounter with the living God on Mount Sinai. A bush burning. And not being consumed. Catching his attention. And the voice says, take the shoes off your feet, for the ground that you stand on is holy. And then we know the account of Exodus chapter 3. Who are you, Lord? I am that I am. I've heard my people's cries. The 430 years are up. You must go and tell Pharaoh. The man that you grew up with, let my people go. I don't usually recommend films, but Kath and I watched a modern version of the Exodus just about a month or so ago. And it's a fascinating insight to the events of the Exodus. Lots of details are wrong. And you'll spend time saying, oh, that's not right, that's not right. But listen to the story, catch the picture. And see just what a 
traumatic thing it was for, 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 for Moses to go back in and tell Pharaoh to let his people go and to see the plagues that were inflicted. And how they, even the Jews themselves didn't like what he was doing because it was causing them more difficulty. They, they, they were no longer given straw to build the bricks or to make the bricks, were they? By faith he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. Why would you do that? Because he's a man of faith. We began by singing immortal, invisible, God only wise. Here's one of the passages it comes from. For he endured. It's interesting, in chapter 12 you'll find that Jesus endured the cross. Same word. It was no walk in the park. It was a terrible time. And it became even worse before he was finally out of it. He endured the seeing him who is invisible. The great truth of the scripture is that while God revealed himself to Moses on Mount Sinai, the burning bush was only a symbol of God wasn't God as such. But he knew he had come into the presence of the creator of the universe, the upholder of life. Yes, yes, but more than that, the God who promised the Saviour. The God who cares for sinners. The God who has gone to incredible lengths to deliver them. And he comes to trust him and to follow him. Exodus 3.11 Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? So God said to him, I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. That's like the promise of the gospel, isn't it? One day we'll be with Jesus. But every day we have to live on here. You might never be somebody prominent and dramatic like Moses. But the church of God is a mighty army made up of ordinary people. And it's as the ordinary people come together because of their vision, because they know that God came and took human form in Christ. It's because they know that that God is righteous, holy and just and gave his son to be a ransom for them. Because they know by the power of the Holy Spirit that they are the sinners for whom Christ died and they embrace him as their saviour. It's because they know That this world is just a passing experience. And the best is yet to come. It's because they're convinced, like Moses. Oh, I need to race, don't I? By faith they passed, sorry, by faith, verse 28, he kept the Passover. We're familiar with the Passover. We participate in a form of it every time we have Lord's Supper. But it was a new thing altogether. After nine plagues, plagues of terror, Moses is instructed to announce to Pharaoh that if the people are not let go, then the firstborn are going to die. Put yourself back into the picture. Moses and Pharaoh are buddies. They've grown up together. When, you're, when your friends have children, are you familiar with them? Of course you are. Think of your best friend. Now think about telling him or her that our oldest child is going to die. Think of the pain. Think of the sorrow. 
embrace, empathize with Moses if you can. As he goes there and he announces this. And he says the only way to escape is to take a, a lamb, kill it, put his blood on the door, on the, on the lintel of the door, so that the angel of death, notice how he's described here, lest he who destroyed the firstborn. Lest the wrath of God be, be, be let out for a minute. Because that's all it would have taken, isn't it? The wrath of God that hangs over unbelievers permanently was released on everybody except those who were under the blood. Christian, that's you and me. Christ is our Passover lamb, says the Apostle Paul. He took our punishment. He, he absorbed the anger of God for our sins and he set us free. And now by his grace we live for his glory. I can't imagine what it was like to be Moses in these situations. But he's a man of faith. He believes what God says. He's living out what God says. And you and I are women and men of faith. And we are called to be the very same. To, to live our days and our circumstances. As men and women of faith. Reminding the world. It's, it's not our religion that saves us. It's our God. Trusting him. So many people settle for religion. Live a good life. Go to church once a month. There's a survey on Radio 4 this morning. Real Christians go to church once a month. Incredible, isn't it? I'm not going there either. Living as a real Christian will cause you to be out of step with the whole world. Not all the time. And it's a call that's on our lives. To live by God's word. And that's where we need to get the unbeliever thinking too, you see. You live without God's word and you'll end up meeting him as your judge. If you will believe God's word and see that these promises have been fulfilled so many times. That it's ridiculous to say you've got a problem with faith. Huh? Huh? I read about a minister who visited an old man who was dying from rheumatism and he found his Bible was open in front of him and he noticed that the word proved was written all over the place in the margin. So he had a conversation with him. What's, what's with the proved in the margin? He says, that's a promise of God which he's made real to me. And the first one is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Proved. Christian, that's where your name, that's where your writing needs to be. An unbeliever, that's exactly what you need to be able to do. Why won't you? It's because of that deceitful heart. Let me race on and, oh dear, in seconds if I can. And just show you something that's fascinating about this passage. No, another thing that's fascinating about this passage. See what it says, by faith they passed through the Red Sea as by dry land. If you know your Bible, and you know the book of Exodus, you know well that this is describing the whole nation of Israel. And it's an incredible insight into what faith is. Because we know that only two of the people that came out of Egypt ever entered the promised land. These people are unbelievers. They are religious people. But you can see that they were persuaded by Moses' faith that they could trust God. They're not long into the land either before they're at Moses' throat saying, Why did you bring us out? Why didn't you leave us back in Egypt? And round in a circle they go for 40 years. Their clothes never wore out, but they did. 
What am I to learn here about faith? Faith is trusting God. Faith is saying to God, I'm going to follow your word. Whenever it speaks to me. I'm going to live as you would have me live. Whereas the Egyptians attempting to do so were drowned. As I said, there are great mysteries in this passage. But I'm not going to be able to plumb the depth of the mysteries today. All I want to do is to get your focus on what this invisible thing like faith looks like. It's all about taking God at his word, standing on his promises. So it's all about standing apart from the way the world thinks and lives. It's all about going as God tells you. You remember that part where Moses gets to the Red Sea, the Egyptians are behind, and God says to him, hold out your rod. And as he puts his foot in the water, that's a bit close to the nail for me. As he puts his foot in the water, the sea opens. My dear friends, faith is living fearlessly in God's presence. Faith, so simple, so powerful. On the memorials in Westminster Abbey, apparently, there's not one that gives a nobler thought than that inscribed on the monument of Lord Lawrence. It simply has his name and the date of his death. And these words, he feared man so little because he feared God so much. I want that kind of faith. And I hope you do. And that you'll receive it by his grace. Amen. Amen.